Edward looked around wildly for something to write on. Of course, there was nothing. His mother kept the living room too neat. Frantically, he read the phone number twice and then he began chanting the numbers in his head. He got up and ran to the kitchen. He grabbed his notepad. His mum ne his mum kept next to the phone. As he pulled it toward him, he knocked the phone off the counter. He didn't even try to grab it. It hit the floor with a crack as he scribbled down the number before he forgot it. Edward pulled out one of the chairs from under the kitchen table. He sat and stared at the phone number. In the living room, a woman screamed on the TV. The sci-fi show was back on. He didn't care. If this worked out, he wouldn't need an escapism anymore. He smiled at the phone number. For the first time in weeks, it didn't feel like a monster was trying to squeeze the heart out of Edward's chest. He suddenly saw a sliver of hope for the, his future. Maybe he could have a friend after all. Edward nodded to himself. He was going to order a friendly face, and then it would be kind of like Jack was still here. As long as Edward had a robotic Faraday, he could pretend his friend was around. He stood and reached for the phone. It wasn't there. Oh, right, he muttered. He looked down at the floor and grim it, grimaced. <laughs> the phone had a crack in the receiver. His mother wasn't going to be happy with him. He turned the phone on and heard the dial tone. Well, at least it still worked. Edward smiled and punched in the number he'd written down. So let me guess, his mother's going to notice that the phone is broken and then, he's gonna, and then she's going to find out about the, the dog, the cat. <laughs> By the time Edward had talked to the nice lady at Fazbear Entertainment and was given the address to which he should send his money and the hair of his lost pet, it was mid-afternoon, he needed to get moving. Now he was pedalling his bike along the sidewalk just a few houses down from Jack's house. He had a lump in his throat and the closer he got to the two-story brick house where his friend had lived, the bigger the lump got. Jack's street was only a couple of blocks from Edward's. Like the street Edward lived on, Jack's street was lined with a mix of older homes that ranged from, a, from quaint craftsmen cottage, cottages like the one Edward and his mum lived in to big Tudor and tall Victorian places. All the homes were guarded by ancient oak and walnut trees, some fronted by tall hedges. Others had picket or wrote iron fences. If only Jack's house... If only Jack's house had had a fence. That was a weird sentence. The street was pretty quiet. Edward heard a few little kids squealing from behind one of the houses. In the distance, a radio played an upbeat pop tune. The music felt all wrong. It should have been slow and dark, something in a minor key. When Edward reached the corner right before Jack's house, he stopped his bike and leaned it against the massive trunk of an old tree in the yard next to Jack's. He stood on shaky legs and swallowed hard before he looked at the street. The street was empty, but in Edward's mind, it wasn't. He began to breathe heavily. What was in Edward's mind got bigger and brighter, and suddenly it seemed to jump out of his head and explode into the street as if he was watching the whole scene once again in real time. There was Faraday gleefully batting at the butterfly. There was Jack, his face stretched into a contorted expression of dread. There was the truck. Edward leaned over and concentrated on breathing. He had to get this over with. Straightening, Edward darted on, onto the street. He didn't even look for cars. He realised after he was in the street, he just ran. He trotted to the place where Jack and Faraday lay. He could, he could see them there. Wait, what? So they just left his bodies in the middle of the road? <laughs> it was a weird pro projection from his mind. He knew, but they looked real, disturbingly real. Because he could see them, he knew exactly where to find some of Faraday's fur. When he got there, though, he realised he wouldn't have needed his mind's upsetting reenactment. A bloodstain marked the spot of Jack's and Faraday's last seconds on Earth. When Edward saw it, he had to clamp his mouth shut to keep from spewing what was left of his undigested soup all over the street. Wanting this over with, Edward spastically scanned the area around the bloodstain for black hair. Oh, right, so there wasn't the bodies, it was just the bloodstains and the hair and stuff. Finally... He spotted some lying at the end of the rust-coloured splotch. Pulling a plastic bag from his pocket, Edward quickly leaned over, plucked the hair from the road, and dropped it into the bag. Then he ran back to his bike, grabbed on, and pedalled away as fast as he could. He was home just a few minutes later. <gasps> Wait! Did he accidentally take Jack's hair <laughs> and then make him into a, into a cat? Tearing into his house, Edward slammed the door and leaned against it, panting. Okay, the hard part is done. Just two more things to do, and they're easy. 
Edward hurried into his mother's home office, perfectly neat and decorated in creams and pale blues. He went into the pine storage armoire in the corner of the room and dug inside it for a small padded envelope and some stamps. He took both of these back into the kitchen and put his money and the plastic bag of Faraday's hair inside the envelope. He added the right postage and after checking the time he went back outside to his bike and headed to the post office. The lady at Fazbear Entertainment had told Edward it would take eight weeks for his friendly face to get to him. Eight weeks! That was a long time, but it was better than being forever without Faraday and Jack. Of course, he knew that his friendly face could not and would not replace Jack and Faraday, but he believed that having an animated reminder of the kitten that he and his best friend had loved so much would help him start wanting to live again. Because right now, he didn't really care too much about life. Edward marked his calendar with the, appro with the approximate date on which he expected his friendly face to arrive, August 28th. Every day he crossed out a square and told himself he was one step closer uh, to having what he was waiting for. The summer was long and lonely. Edward's mother suggested that he go on a camp, but he flatly refused. He threatened to put him in a summer school. Uh, she threatened to put him in a summer school. You like to learn, she coaxed. He shook his head. If you enrol me, I'll run away from home. Blackmail? Yeah, I'll find you if you do that. I read a lot, Mum. Edward said. I've read a lot about going off the grid too. It won't, I won't be easy to locate. His mother just shook her head and went back to work. When Edward's mother began talking about moving to a different town for a fresh start, Edward realised he'd better do something to prevent such a drastic action. Will you take me to the library tomorrow to get some books? He asked her over a Sunday breakfast of overcooked French toast. His mum wasn't stellar in the kitchen, but most of what she made was edible. Sure, she said. The eagerness in her voice made him feel bad. She was thinking that he was snapping out of it. He wasn't. Day after day, he crawled by. Finally, August 28th came and went. No package. Edward called Fazbear Entertainment. Where's my friendly face? He asked another m nice lady on the phone. Could you give me your name, dear? Edward Coulter. He listened to keyboard clicking through the phone line. Here you are, she sang out after a moment. There was a delay in manufacturing because of a production anomaly. Oh. Oh. <laughs> We're so sorry for your inconvenience, but you should have your friendly face in about two weeks. We'll include a discount coupon for another Fast for Entertainment order as an apology for the delay. Edward sighed. He didn't want another... Uh, fast for entertainment stuff. Uh, he wanted his robotic Faraday. Now he was going to have to go back to school after his animatronic cat arrived. Somehow that made returning to school even more depressing than it already was. But what could he do except wait? So he waited. Two weeks into his new school year, two weeks of being studiously avoided by every one of his classmates, two weeks of being babied by the high school teen uh, teachers who'd been informed of May's tragedy, and Edward was trying to get used to being a freshman without his friend by his side. Every day was an exercise in endurance, just getting through the long hours until he could go home and check his mail. Finally, on a Monday afternoon, he arrived home to find a package waiting for him on the front porch. Yes, he shouted before snatching it up and taking it inside. Edward dropped his backpack on the floor right beside, right inside the door. His mum hated when he did that, but he'd pick it up later. He ran into the kitchen with his package, setting the big cardboard box with the Fazbear Entertainment logo on the counter. Edward hurried to the knife block by the stove and pulled out a paring knife. A gust of wind outside rattled the small paned window over the sink. He glanced out. The black clouds he noticed overhead during his bus ride home from school were churning low in the sky. They were in for a storm. He didn't care. Turning his back on the window, he returned to the kitchen table. Outside, a dog barked incessantly, almost frenzied and frenziedly, so much so that if Edward hadn't been in a hurry to open his package, he'd have checked on it. Other than the crazy dog, it was quiet. The only sound inside the house was the low hum of the refrigerator. Edward began carefully slicing along the seal of the Fazbear Entertainment box. The seal was black and white checked, like the background in the commercial he'd seen. It had Freddy Fazbear stickers spaced every few inches as well. It felt kind of bad slicing through Freddy's toothy smile. 
The knife made a chuffing sound as it soared through the cardboard. Edward's breath came in excited little gasps that joined the knife's rhythm. Edward didn't bother to cut the tape at the ends of the box. He just grabbed both sides of the lid and yanked, tearing the tape with a snap. Taking a deep breath, he flipped back the lid and started digging through the styrofoam peanuts that covered his prize. The peanuts flew as he th reached through them. They snowed all over the table and the floor. Edward ignored them and also the small instruction booklet he found in the peanuts. He could see black hair on the body of a medium-sized cat. He was almost shaking in anticipation of meeting his new robotic pal. Digging out more styrofoam, he got a grip of his new friendly face. Then he pulled it from the box in a spray of more peanuts that skittered this way and that. Edward lifted the friendly face from the box and held it up before his eyes. Edward screamed and dropped the friendly face. It landed on its legs in the open box, and the styrofoam peanuts held it upright before uh, Edward's appalled gaze. He staggered a couple steps back from the table. What had he done? Edward could hear his mother's voice in his head. Edward, you have to be more careful. How many times had she, she told him that his single-minded focus would get him in trouble? How many accidents had he had to clean up because he wasn't thinking about what he was doing? How many times had he messed up in school, making him the butt of the endless jokes? Though a day Edward had shot into the street to pluck hair from the pavement, the only thing he'd been thinking about was being done with, this distract, with, this, with his disgusting task so he could send off his order for his friendly face. He hadn't been really looking at what he was doing. He hadn't examined the hair he'd gathered to make sure it was cat hair. I called it, I called it. He just scraped up the first black hair he'd seen and he'd taken off. And this is what he'd got for it. Sitting in front of Edward, perched on top of a mound of styrofoam peanuts like a deformed king, the body of a robotic cat was attached to the stiff, powder white face of Jack. Not Faraday, Jack. Oh my god. I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> Instead of Faraday's sweet, furry face, the face Edward had expected to see when he'd opened the box, the human hairs Edward had sent in had resulted in the stark white mould of a dead-looking human face. Jack's face. On the hard material, Jack's brown eyes were motionless, but they appeared to be gazing intelligently at Edward, just waiting for Edward to say something so Jack could reply with his usual affected display of esoteric knowledge. Edward struggled to breathe as he stared at Jack's slightly flat nose, thick lips turned up in a smile, and his broad chin. These were Jack's features, attached to an animatronic cat. It was an abomination. Edward felt sick. Using the back of his hand to knock the friendly face out of the way, Edward dumped the, remi the remainder of the styrofoam peanuts from the box. He looked at the empty box and the thing that was part his, his friend and part cat robot. Then he wildly surveyed the kitchen. Spotting the wooden spoon in a pottery jar above the stove, or by the stove, sorry, which his mother used for her cooking utensils, he rushed over and grabbed it. He then picked up the box and held its opening level with the kitchen table. He used the spoon to shove the awful, what, creature, machine, into the box. He knew he was acting crazy, but he didn't want to touch the thing. It was just too creepy, too wrong. Once he got the nasty friendly face in the box, he pushed the instructions manual into the box as well. He didn't even want to look at the manual. He had no intention of activating this thing. He looked around again. He had to get rid of it. He didn't want to just throw it away. Firstly, if he did it, if he did that, his mum could find it. Second, the garbage was far too easy to get out of. Edward gasped and took two steps away from the table. Why had he just thought that? He shook his head. He didn't want to ponder this morbid place from which that thought had arisen. He'd read way too many horror stories and science fiction novels, watched too many macar... Ma is it macabre or ma machabra? I don't know macabre movies. He was being ridiculous, of course, but he still wasn't going to throw this thing in the trash. No, he was going to bury it. Huh, interesting. Outside, thunder rumbled. He glanced out the window. The sky was still roiling. He'd have to hurry. Grabbing the box, taking care not to touch what was inside, Edward hurried out the back door of the kitchen. 
he scurried to the garden shed at the rear end of the yard. With fumbling fingers, he turned the dial of the combination lock. It, looked, it took three tries before he got the numbers to line up right so he could get the lock open. Finally, he was able to get into the shed. He grabbed a shovel and trotted to the perimeter of the yard, right up against the fence at the edge of the property. If he could have taken the friendly face someplace off his property, he would have. He wanted it far away, but he needed the thing buried now. He had no way to transport it, and even if he did, the storm clouds were about to release their burden. He didn't really want to be outside in a thunderstorm, so he started digging. He dug a two foot diameter hole about a foot down when he saw a streak of lightning out the corner of his eye. Even though his hands smarted, he dug even faster. In only a few more minutes, he had the hole deep enough. Running back to the deck, Edward grabbed the box, then returned even faster to the hole he'd dug. The skies overhead grumbled loudly, a drop of rain landed on his nose. Edward dumped the contents of the box into the hole. The manual hit the, dust, uh, hit the dirt first. The friendly face landed on the manual, face up. Edward groaned when the rigid version of his friend's smiling features looked up at him. He tossed aside the box and began shoveling dirt into the hole at the breakneck pace. Every clod of dirt that hit uh, the jack face made him flinch. He felt like he was burying his friend alive. He could have sworn the jack face, though wearing Jack's non-stop smile, looked accusatory. Oh, that's a nice detail. Ignoring the condena co yeah, condemnation in the fake jack face, Edward shoveled until the white was obscured and finally covered completely, stamping down the dirt once he had it all over the hole. He wasn't happy with the slight mound that it was left, but he hoped the rain might pound the dirt enough for it to settle in and around the friendly face. A couple more drops hit Edward with sore, dirty hands. He grabbed the empty box and the shovel. He darted into the shed, put the shovel where it belonged, and tucked the box behind a few other empty boxes his mother saved just in case. He'd get rid of it later. He barely got the door closed, and the lock clicked into place when, before the rain started coming down in heavy sheets. By the time he was back in the kitchen, he was soaked. When he went inside, he left mud and water all over the kitchen floor. He glanced at the clock over the phone. He had just an hour before his mum would be home. He had to hurry if he was going to dispose of the styrofoam peanuts and clean up the floor before she got here. Even though Edward was now 13, his mum still came into the room to kiss him goodnight. That usually bugged him, but tonight her fussing was welcome. Edward was so rattled by the awful friendly face that he was having trouble slowing his breathing. The weather wasn't helping. Outside his window, the storm had that had just begun that had begun just as he finished burying the jack cat robot thing was now slamming into the house like an army storming a castle. Every clap of thunder sounded like a thwack of a catapult being loosed upon a fortress. Every blanket of rain that rattled against the side of the house sounded like a spray of arrows beating down on the poor beleaguered inhabitants of the stronghold. That was how Edward saw himself and his mother, two defenceless commoners, huddled against the onslaught of the enemy, unable to defend themselves. All evening, Edward recoiled every, t recoiled every time the thunder boomed. After the third time, he pulled him into himself like a turtle hiding in its shell. His mum said, Edward, what in the world? You've never been afraid of thunder before. It's not the thunder, he said. Then what is it? Her hair was down for the evening. It hung around her face, making her look much younger and friendlier than she did when she had it up for work. She peered at him as if she could figure out what was going on with him by looking hard enough. He shook his head. It's nothing. I'm just being weird. You're not weird, his mum said. Edward laughed. I thought you lawyers had some code that didn't let you lie. His mum smiled. That's true, but I am allowed to bend the truth a bit. You're not weird. You're unique. Edward laughed again. Then the rain pummeled the windows once more. He jumped up. I think I'll go to bed early. Now at his bedside, his mum felt his forehead. You feel a little hot. You might have a fever. Maybe that's why the storm is bothering you this evening. Edward shrugged. Maybe. It wasn't exactly a lie. He, was, he just might have a fever, and it could be adding to the trepidation 
that sat on his chest like a gargoyle. Do you want me to take your temperature? His mother asked. Oops. I'm not a baby, Edward said. I can take it myself, but I'd rather go to sleep now. His mum pressed her lips together, then nodded. She leaned over and kissed his cheek. I love you, kiddo. Love you too, mum. His mum gave him one last look, walked to the door, turned off the light, and left the room. Edward wasn't ready to close his eyes, so he blinked and let his eyes adjust to the near dark. As soon as they did, he could make out the various items in his room. Enough light came in under the door from the hallway to illuminate the outline of his desk, still mostly buried under a pile of clothes he refused to move, and the sharp contours of his shelves. A small nightlight on the other side of the room cast a glow that, hit, that lit up his bulletin board just enough to remind him of the photos he still couldn't bring himself to look at, nor take down. Edward felt as stiff as a corpse. He groaned. Now, why did he have to compare himself to a corpse? What was wrong with him? Why was he letting the friendly face bother him so much? It was just a stupid toy that went wrong. He shuddered and pulled the covers up to his chin. Or was it? The problem was, it wasn't just a toy. It was something designed to be animated, something that contained his dead friend's DNA. He didn't want to think about the thousand and one ways that he, that could be bad. Stop it. Edward hissed at himself. He needed an imagined ton Tommy, or whatever they might call it if one's imagination could be cut away from a person's mind. He, his was way too sinister tonight. Edward forced himself to close his eyes. He concentrated on a logic problem from math class and eventually he relaxed enough to fall asleep. Edward sat up in his bed. He was perfectly still. He listened. Something had awakened him. But what? Outside, rain still drummed on the roof. The thunder was so loud and so powerful that each reverberation made the house shake. Was that what had yanked him out of sleep? He frowned and kept listening. He didn't think so. The sound that disturbed him hadn't been an ordinary sound, and it hadn't been a loud sound. It had been a subtle sound, and uh, a sinuous and sly sort of sound. Something like a pattering, but not a friendly pattering like the rain. Edward reached over and turned on the small brass lamp that sat on his oak nightstand. As soon as he rotated the, w the switch, a bolt of lightning lit up the shade pulled over his window, and his nightstand light, out. light went out. So did his nightlight. The storm had taken over the power. Great. That was just great. Edward felt around in the dark and pulled open his nightstand drawer. He grabbed his flashlight and turned it on. I'm getting uh, uh, out of stock <laughs> vibes from this. Hesitating to see if he could talk himself out of believing he'd heard something, Edward failed to do so and forced himself to get out of bed. He listened intently, concentrating on peeling back the auditory layers of the storm so he could hear whatever that was skulking under those more assertive sounds. Was... what? Uh, sorry, what had he heard? Edward shone his light this way and that as he crossed his room. Nothing was out of place. When he reached the door, uh, he cautiously opened it. He peered out and pointed the beam of his flashlight down the hallway. The hall was empty. Edward tiptoed down the hall and aimed his light into the living room. It looked perfectly normal. From behind his mum's closed door, he heard snoring. She was a heavy sleeper. Edward continued his tour out of the house, checking in his mum's home office, in the bathroom and in the kitchen. Nothing was out of place. He returned to his room, got in bed and turned out his flashlight. As soon as he lay in head, his head back on the pillow, he heard a creak. Edward stiffened. Had he imagined that? If he hadn't imagined it, did it mean something was in the house? Something? Why did he think something? Wouldn't it be more reasonable to think someone? Reasonable, sure. Accurate? He didn't think so. He waited, again trying to listen past the storm. A faint scrape came from, a, up from outside his door. Edward flipped on his flashlight again. He shined it at his door, spotlighting the doorknob. All the slowly turning doorknob scenes in every creepy movie he'd ever watched started running through his mind, and by the time he'd gone through just a few of them, he could have sworn his doorknob was turning as well. But was it? Wanting nothing more than to hide under his bed, close his eyes and cover his ears, Edward took a deep breath and threw back the covers, keeping his gaze on his doorknob, which didn't seem to be moving at all. 
did it? He crept across his room, leaned against his door and listened. Rain continued to batter the house. Between blasts of wind, thunder detonated, always just a second or so after the room blazed bright for an instant, the lightning was hitting close by. Between the rain's thrum and the thunder's bellows, Edward had trouble picking out any other sounds. But wait, there... what was that? He frowned, pushed harder against his door, and concentrated. Had he imagined that sound? No. There it was again. It was a chittering sound, something like metal tapping on wood, only really fast, or like marbles cascading down a metal tube. What was that? You see, at this point, I'm taking what he's saying with a grain of salt, because I read Pizza Kit and didn't realise that half of it was a nightmare, <laughs> and then I regretted it. Um, I, don't, I don't think this is a nightmare, but... Um, it might be. I don't know. Ugh. Edward gripped his flashlight hard and opened his door. His flashlight was pretty bright. 2,400 lumens. So he was able to brighten the entire hall when he aimed the light straight ahead. The hall was, as it had been before, empty. He swung the light toward the opening to the living room. Shadows from beyond the opening hunched in wait for him. He listened for another few seconds, and when he heard the sound again... Was it more skittering than chittering? He tentatively moved toward the living room. As he went, his light and his head swiveled this way and that. Why couldn't he tell where the sound was coming from? It had to be the storm. The cacophony outside was disrupting his ear's ability to pinpoint direction. For one second, he thought the sound was coming from behind the, his mother's door. But no, that was just her bed creaking when she turned over in her sleep. She, he was pretty sure. The next second he thought the sound originated in the living room, but when he stepped into that room and shone his light right, left and centre, he saw nothing out of place. Then he heard the sound again, and it seemed to be coming from just inside the back door. He slunk into the kitchen, then quickly aimed his light at the door. It was closed tight, the deadbolt in the right position. He heard a click and shot his light to the left. Nothing. It must have been the refrigerator. Shaking his head at his paranoia, Edward muttered, Just go back to bed and make an opossum. Would you? What's an opossum? <laughs> I have no idea what an opossum is. Oh, make like an opossum. Okay. I, I, I thought it was like a cake or something. <laughs> go back to bed and make like an opossum, would you? As he retreated back to his room, retracing his steps through the living room, his light still spastically searching for the source of the odd sounds, he idly wondered whether opossums had overactive uh, imaginations like his. This nonsensical query gave him a few seconds of relief from the tension, turning his muscles into coils ready to snap <laughs> just the slightest. A pft, pft, pft came from right behind him. Edward whirled. His light jittered into every inky, inky, inky crevice of the living room. It found nothing unusual. By now, Edward's breath was coming in little puffs. He was just one more sound away from screaming his head off. He couldn't take this much longer. Edward scuttled down the hall, dashed into his room, and yanked the door shut behind him. He pointed the flashlight all over his room. It was just as he'd left it. You're an idiot, Edward told himself. He strode to his bed, dove in, and pulled up the covers. His flashlight had a broad base so he could set it upright. He did that, then lay back and stared at the distorted circle of light splayed out over his ceiling. The flashlight's beam hit his small ceiling fan and contorted it into a many tentacled ceph... Oh god, cephalopod. Is that how you say it? I think so. That kind of freaked him out, but he wasn't able to turn out the flashlight. Nope, no way. Edward focused on the outer edges of the light above him. Another gust of wind hit the house with a thwump, and more rain sprayed his window. Then the rain and wind hushed for an instant. In that instance, uh, Edward heard tapping, clear, distinct tapping. It sounded like a small animal prancing down the hall. This time, Edward didn't hesitate. He leaped from his bed, grabbed his flashlight, strode to the door and threw it open. He aimed his flashlight at the door, sure he was going to light up whatever was approaching his room. Nothing was in the hallway. Outside, the storm's decibel level went back up. The opening to the living room brightened as lightning speared the night again. 
thunder roared before the living room even had time to, be, to return to its gloom. The wind picked up and it shrieked around the house. It sounded like angry banshees were descending on the house in abject fury. But even through all that clamour, Edward heard another sound. This time, it was a ticking sound. But not a regular ticking sound like a clock. Tick, 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 tick. The last five ticks came very fast. And then, nothing but the storm. Edward felt like he was going to cry. He couldn't remember ever being this scared. Well, except for those few seconds before Jack and Faraday... Edward moaned and turned to run back into his room. He slammed his door behind him, not caring what, whether it woke up his mum, even secretly hoping it did wake her. He wouldn't have admitted it to anyone, but he wanted his mummy. Badly. Edward jumped back into his bed, literally, and curled up into a ball under the covers. He held his flashlight to his chest, cradling it like a teddy bear. If only he had a teddy bear. Edward rolled onto his back and concentrated on calming his ratchet, ratcheting breath. You're making it all up, he told himself. It's all in your head. That's what I said. Uh, <laughs> he needed a distraction from his out-of-control evil fantasy world. He decided to use what had worked for him in the past. He would recite pi. Oh, I know pi. 3.14159265. <laughs> uh, out loud, Edward began. 3.14159265358. His heart... Be the next digit is 5, by the way. You can go check. Uh, his heart rate began to slow. His muscles be start started to relax. He stopped reciting, put his thumb on the flashlight switch and resolved. Turned it off. He clapped the flashlight in his hand, but he let his hand fall down by his side. He returned to his nice tranquilizing numbers. 9793233846264338327950288419716939375101019713710 Why is that in here? Okay. I don't think you need to recite all of those, but whatever. Uh, his eyes dro drooped close. Uh, his eyes drooped closed. He felt sleep slip in and wrap its comforting arms around him. He let it take him away from him. A clunk followed by a shush ripped Edward from his sleep. He pulled his arm from under the covers and turned on his flashlight. Its glow landed on the end of the bed. And Jack's mud-streaked, smiling face, Edward screamed and screamed. Continuing to scream, Edward flat th thrashed backward in his bed, his legs kicking out. His covers got caught in his gyrating feet, and the sheet and blanket pulled off the bed and landed in a pile on the floor. Edward's bedroom door burst open, and his mother ran into the room, her own flashlight bobbing out in front of her. Edward? She was out of breath. What in the world? In a half second, Edward took his mum took in his mum's tangled hair, her pale makeupless face, her wrinkled nightshirt. Then he looked beyond her, trying to spot the familiar visage that he knew was attached to a rob robotic cat. It was no longer at the foot of his bed. Where did it go? It had to be in here someplace. Of course, it's all in his head, because he's guilty of all of it. Oh god. Another one of these stories. <laughs> He hadn't imagined that face. It had been that horrible manufactured Jack face, and it had been staring right at him. But how? With shaking hands, Edward shined his light around the room. Edward? His mum repeated. He worked his tongue around his mouth because his mouth was too dry to speak. A little bit like mine right now. Sorry, mum, he said finally. She rubbed her eyes. What happened? Edward kept shining his light around the room. He kept looking for even a hint of movement, but he saw nothing that wasn't supposed to be there. He looked at his mum. I was sure something was in here. She straightened and then bent over again and picked up his covers. Setting down her flashlight, she arranged the covers on the bed. Edward realised he was still crouched by his headboard. He made himself stretch out his legs and he slid them under the sheet and blanket. His mum sat on the bed next to him. It's the storm. It messed with my sleep a little too. Edward nodded. Come on, let's get you tucked back in, his mum said. He let her baby him. He could feel himself trembling, and he hoped she didn't notice. 
The storm moved on to torment a different town just before dawn. Edward was awake to listen to it withdraw. He was awake all night. For reasons he didn't understand, he had never heard another odd sound after his mum returned to bed, and he hadn't seen Jack's face any more that night. Where had it gone? He spent the better part of the night trying to figure out whether he'd imagined the dirty, stiff, white face of his friend at the end of his bed. No, that wasn't true. What he'd been doing was trying to convince himself that he hadn't seen it, that it had been some weird trick of the light, a misperception, his brain turning a lump in the covers into the Jack features. But he knew he was deluding himself. He'd seen what he'd seen. Maybe he's just hella high. <laughs> Jack's face had been looking right at him. It wasn't something that looked like anything else, but Edward sure wished it was, because after that night, he began seeing the horrid Jack face everywhere. The first time Edward saw the Jack face again, he was getting off the bus at the end of the day after the storm. Apparently, his classmates had stopped feeling sorry for him, and now they were mad at him for, suge uh, for suggesting Schrodinger's cat as a paper topic. I love that topic of Schrodinger's cat. Uh, <laughs> pausing to flick off a spitball that hit him just as he went down the bus's steps, his gaze landed on the yellow mums that surrounded Mrs. Phillips' baseball cap wearing gnomes. Her gnomes wore the caps starting in September until the World Series was over. Can I just say, this is a very creepy idea of like the face appearing everywhere he goes. Um, oh, it's very reminiscent of the, uh, the Fredbear plush. Huh? <laughs> um, also, uh, Schrodinger's cat. It's funny you should mention that because that is a cat that's in a box and you don't know if it's dead or alive, if it's got a 50-50 chance of it dying. I guess that could have, like, um, connections to this story. Like, like it's... You don't know if it's dead or alive right now, because it's all in his head, right? I don't know. <laughs> I need some time to think about that. Edward was shrugging into his backpack when he saw the face. It was right where he and Jack had found Faraday, and it was peering up at Edward from under a low-hanging ro rhododendron branch. Edward gasped and stared. Then he blurted, What do you want? What do I want? Mrs. Phillips asked. Edward jumped up and looked up at Mrs. Phillips's walkway. A magical weed disappearer, <laughs> Mrs. Phillips said. Do you have one of those? The widow was kneeling at the edge of her walkway, pulling weeds. Long grey hair spilled over her hunched shoulders. She wore a bright fuchsia running suit and a purple tennis sh shoes. <laughs> a purple tennis shoes. Oh, hi, Mrs. Phillips. I didn't see you there. She frowned at him, brushing dirty fingers across her tan-lined face. Then who were you talking to? Huh? Edward flicked his gaze back down to the flower bed. Jack's face was gone. Apologies. Uh, he looked again at Mrs. Phillips. Oh, I was just practicing lines for a school play. Mrs. Phillips smiled. Good for you. I wish you luck with that. She returned to her weeding, and Edward waved goodbye and turned to continue down the street. As he walked, he scanned his surroundings. Where had the friendly face gone? Or more important, had he really seen it again? Before he'd left for school that morning, Edward had considered going out into the yard to see if the thing was still buried there, but there was no way to do it without his mum knowing about it. She left for work right when he left to catch the bus. Now he wasn't sure if he wanted to know if the jack-faced cat was still in the hole. If it was, that meant... what? That he was losing his mind? Or that the nasty thing had the ability to dig itself out and rebury itself just to torment him? It's all infinite possibility, Jack's voice whispered into his mind. Unfortunately, Ed wasn't a, plan of, uh, wasn't a fan of duality right now. It suggested far too many alarming options. Edward hurried up the sidewalk. In dizzying contrast yesterday and the previous day, today was mild and sunny. Several people in the neighbourhood were, were out cleaning up debris from the storm. A lot of branches had come down. Leaves and twigs were everywhere. Edward heard at least three leaf blowers and one lawnmower. The air smelled like mul mulk, mulch. <laughs> 
Just before Edward got to his own walkway, he caught a glimpse of something white out of the corner of his eye. Turning, he was sure he saw the jack-faced cat trot around behind his neighbor's house. Edward starred. St starred? Stared. <laughs> Should he go after it? He felt his legs start to shake. Well, there was his answer. He was too much of a coward to go after the thing and, what, confront it? Destroy it? He had no idea what to do. So, he'd do nothing. Edward ran up his walkway and scrambled, uh, scrambled at the lock on his front door and dashed inside. He slammed the door behind him. Leaning against it, he took several deep breaths. Should he go into the backyard and dig? He had to. Heading to the door before he could change his mind, Edward went out into the backyard and looked at the spot where he'd buried the jack-faced cat. The mound was flattened down, but the rain could have done that. Given that a small puddle had collected on top of where the mound had been, that was likely. Other than the puddle, the area looked just the way Edward had left it. Edward? Edward spun around. His mum stood on the back deck. What are you doing? She called. Oh, just checking for, um, storm damage. Good thinking. That's why I came home early. Wanna help me do a little yard cleanup? So much for digging up the hole. Edward couldn't help but notice he felt relieved. By the time Edward went to bed that evening, he was too tired to even care what the friendly face was doing. And the next day, the kids at school were so der derisive, he began to think it might be nice to have the friendly face around after all. Maybe the freakish robot was the only friend he would have to he would hope to have. But no, he didn't want that thing as a friend. He didn't want it at all. Which was why, by the end of the week, Edward was a fidgety mess of overreactive nerves. It didn't seem to matter what he wanted. He kept seeing the jack-faced cat everywhere. Or at least he thought he did. When Edward and Jack had been in junior high school, they'd ferreted out all of the good secluded spots in the building, places they could hang out without encountering other kids. They'd often talked about how their first task as a freshman would be to find those sorts of places in the high school. Well, Jack wasn't here to help, but Edward still went looking for, a seclu for seclusion, and he found it in an old, unused supply closet, under a back stairway, in a hidden courtyard, behind the teacher's lounge, behind a section of collapsible bleachers in the gym. But every place he found, the jack-faced cat found too. He only got to use each of his reclusive spots once before he spotted the face peering at him from the deeper shadows of the hidden areas. That's so creepy. Twice he was sure he saw the friendly face hunched over it, the, uh, hunched under the bushes near the school's entrance, tucked among the leaves, just out of view of the casual passerby. At home he spotted Jack's face in the bushes and plants in his yard, poking up through the hydra... Uh, hydrangeas, <laughs> I don't know flower names, outside the kitchen window, peering past the boxwood hedge outside the living room window and lurking in the branches of the drooping forsythia <laughs> bush under his own window. And the sounds he'd heard the night of the storm, now he heard them everywhere, chittering, ticking, bizarre pneumatic pattering sounds. He heard those all the time now in his hiding places at school, in his house, He'd heard the strange, sibilant pitter-patter outside his door every night this week. Whoa, what if he... What if he's, um... What if he's, like, living in a dream? And he can, and he can hear the outside thing, but he's, like, paralyzed in a dream or something. That, that's a weird theory. Uh, that's a terrible theory, actually. Uh, gr <laughs> granted, he never opened his door to see just what was out there. But he had slept with his lights on. He'd wait until after his mum went to sleep and he'd turn on the brass lamp. The first night, he didn't sleep well with all that light. The next night though, he went right to sleep, probably because he was so exhausted from two nights of practically no sleep. Now it was Friday, four days since the storm, and Edward still hadn't gone up to dig the jack-faced cat's grave. Two days after the storm, it had started raining again and it hadn't stopped until today. The sun came out at noon while Edward ate his peanut butter sandwich by himself next to a window in the school cafeteria. It was then that he decided he had to check the hole when he got home. If the friendly face was still there, he might have to ask his mum to take him for an M MRI. Maybe he had a tumour, or maybe he was he, maybe he maybe was going crazy. 
Maybe he'd imagined the whole friendly face thing from start to finish. The very concept seemed outlandish to him, even now. Give me an ending! <laughs> After school, Edward was running late when he trotted toward the bus. He had enough time, but he wouldn't be able to pick up his seat the way he used to. There were certain kids he never wanted to sit beside. Kids who liked to torture him more than others. He was late because he'd gone into the deserted restroom after his last class. While washing his hands, he glanced in the mirror and spotted the jack face looking over his shoulder at him. But when he wheeled around, there was nothing there. He thought he had a pattering behind a vent cover that looked askew, and he was debating whether he should check it when three other boys had burst into the restroom. Edward had been forced to run before they tried to stick his head in the toilet. A bit like Col- uh, what was his name? Colton? I, I believe it was Colton. Colton from, uh, from what we found. Who got his head stuck in the toilet. Uh, now Edward was just a few feet from the bus when Eddie, one of the particularly obnoxious guys in his class, deliberately bumped into him. Edward staggered and almost fell. He was close enough to the bus to put out a hand and catch himself. When he did, he got a glimpse of the jack face peeking out from behind the bus bus's back fender. It was clinging to the emergency exit, hidden between uh, Edward's bus and the bus behind, down low where no one except Edward could see it. It was on his bus. Edward backed away. He was bumped again, this time by Julia. Watch where you're going, she snapped at him. Sorry, he didn't even look at her pretty wavy hair as he continued to backpedal. The buses, the buses in front of Edward started to roll forward. Coming? The bus driver called from inside. Edward looked at the wheel well... Uh, looked at the wheel well where he'd seen the jack face. He thought he'd saw movement, but he wasn't sure. No, I forgot something. I'll walk. Thanks. Don shrugged and closed the bus door. The bus pulled out. Edward stared at it after it, but it didn't see anything except kids through any of the windows. <sighs> After the buses were gone, Edward sighed. He just left his paranoia force him into a six-mile walk. Brilliant. Sighing again, Edward settled his backpack more comfortably on his shoulders and started walking down the school driveway. How long is this story? Oh my god. Okay. We should be there soon. The road that led from the school back into town didn't have any sidewalks, just a narrow gravel verge that was snug up against the massive tree trunks lining the road. Along the verge, ferns and other low-growing underbush created a green shaggy carpet that extended into the dusky depths of the forest. Here and there, the shaggy carpet gave way to beds of fallen fir needles. These were the paths that a lot of kids used to head into the woods. Not Edward. He would stay out here on the road, thank you very much. A few cars motored past Edward. One of them honked its horn. He had no idea who was in it. Beds... Wait... Never mind, that was a line from before, the, the formatting is weird. Uh, he coughed on the gas fumes that lingered in the wake of the last car. He turned to look behind him to see if more cars were coming. He froze. No cars were coming up the road, but something was. <gasps> it was the friendly face. Is he going to run him over? <laughs> it was right there, clear as could be. No mistaking it for anything else. This wasn't one of those fleeting glimpses. This wasn't just a peek of the pale jack face. This is the honest to goodness, real friendly face. The black cat, its fur now matted and muddy, possibly from being buried and digging itself out, and the haunting jack figures with the unyielding smile. The jack faced cat was skipping along the edge of the road. Oh, I thought it was in a car. <laughs> Gam gamboling happily ever, happily after uh, Edward as if they were playing a game of follow the leader. Edward didn't stop to think, he just ran. At first, he ran down the road, but when he checked over his shoulder, he could see that Jack's face was getting closer. There was no way he could outrun an animatronic on a flat, open road. He had no choice if he wanted to get away. Um, he, re he veered to his left, in between two towering trees. Edward scraped his shoulder against the bark of the second tree, but he kept running. He leaped over a scrubby bush, and he trampled a cluster of ferns. He didn't take time to look behind him again. He just fled, pell-mell, through the damp and dingy woods. A few hundred feet into the trees, Edward reached a creek. He didn't slow down, he splashed across it. He raced up the incline on the other side of the creek. 
slipping when his feet encountered a pile of river rocks. Windmilling his arms to get his balance, Edward turned, intending to run along the flat part of the terrain here, instead of having to climb any higher up from the creek. But a, a splash made him check back behind him again. The cat thing was capering along in Edward's wake. Its tail was up in the air as if it was having the time of its life. Life? It had no life. It wasn't alive. It was just a thing. Edward wasn't fooled by the thing's happy expression. The smile was too set, too hard to suggest any good feelings. Given that the jack-faced cat was functioning, moving, maybe even, God forbid, thinking, it was fair to say it was alive, at least in a robotic way. That meant when he put it in the hole and covered it with dirt, he buried it alive. Was it angry? What would it do when it reached him? Edward squeaked in panic and turned to run again, scrambling up a slippery bank, he fell to his knees and clawed his way to the top. Realising that the, realizing that his backpack was slowing him down, Edward shrugged out of it and he managed to get back on his feet. His breath came in ragged gasps and he ordered his legs to keep going, to run, hard. It had been stupid to run into the forest. He'd have been better off on the road where there are other people, where someone might be able to pull him over and help him. He tried to think it through while he ran, tried to discern whether he was still being followed. At first, all he could hear were his own footfalls and laboured breathing. But then he heard the ticking and that pneumatic sounding patter. His throat tightened. Frenzies, oh, frenzied, he ploughed his way through a dense thicket of some greenery he didn't rec recognise and found the creek again. It had curled around. He figured if he recrossed it, he'd end up back at the road eventually. Could he stay out in front of the jack-faced cat long enough to get there? He risked a glance over his shoulder. Go away, he screeched when he saw the thing frisking along merrily, bouncing and hopping playfully in the furrows Edward's feet left in the undergrowth. He put his back to Jack's face and stumbled toward the creek again. When he reached it, he leaped across its deepest part. His foot landed on a rock and his ankle twisted. He cried out, he, but he didn't go down. Tears filled his eyes as he kept running, ignoring the throbbing pain. He wasn't sure how long he ran after he crossed the creek. It felt like he was running in circles. Was that the same tree he'd just passed? How could he tell? They all looked alike. He didn't look back again. The occasional tick, tick, tick was enough to let him know his pursuer was still after him. The pain in his ankle got worse every time his foot pounded the ground. His legs started feeling weak. He could hear rails in his lungs. His felt, his felt, his heart. I, I, I think there's a, a mistype there. I think it's supposed to say he felt his heart trying to hammer its way out of his chest. I don't know though. Uh, he was beginning to think he was going to run himself into death from exhaust exhaustion uh, when he noticed light creeping in between the trees ahead. He thought he heard the rush of an engine going past on the road. He was almost there. He tried to run faster, but he was so tired. His steps faltered. Something touched Edward's ankle. He glanced down. The jack face smiled up at him. Edward screamed, put his head down, and pumped his arms to push his body even faster. Just a few more steps. He sprinted hard, his gaze firmly on the ground in front of him so he couldn't trip over something and go down. He couldn't see clearly, though. Uh, everything was blurry, probably because his eyes were filled with tears and sweat. It didn't matter, he kept running. He bolted forward, pelting away from the thing behind him, hurtling toward what he hoped was... Edward felt a flash of pain, so intense, that it couldn't possibly have been real. The pain was the last thing he felt. That pain was incomprehensible, and it was the last thing he thought. He never even had a chance to think. Sorry. No, that's not the ending. Okay, I thought it was the ending. <laughs> I got scared there. The semi-truck that hit Edward started skidding right after the impact. The driver, his eyes bulging, his heart racing, his stomach suddenly in a bilious knot, practically stood on the truck's brake pedal. Of course, it was too late. The semi-truck kept going for several yards before Jack Niff knife knifing to a stop. Well... Well behind the truck, Edward's body lay in the road, a pool of blood widening around it. A few feet away, partially hidden in the ferns at the edge of the verge, the frowny face hunkered down. 
It flicked its robotic tail. Its smiling jack face kept its gaze serenely focused on Edward's still form. It would wait now. It would wait patiently for Edward to get back up. So they could play some more. No, that's not the end. That's the end. Oh, that ending is bittersweet. Okay. Okay. I do have, I do have, uh, what are they called? Goosebumps. I do have the goosebumps on my face. Wow. That was a good ending. That was a really good ending. I feel like it happened very suddenly. But, um, but the, the last few lines, wow. Just wow. That last line in particular, it would wait now. It would wait patiently for Edward to get back up so they could play some more. It's like so creepy. So creepy. So, hmm. Interesting. I, I guess, um, obviously, um, the friendly face was probably programmed by Fazbear Entertainment anyway to like say that sort of thing, to, to think that sort of way. Uh, but I guess also half of it is uh, actually Jack. So I, I think half of it is cursed and half of it is just like, I want to play with you. Why, are you. why are you running away from me and stuff? I don't know. This is a really weird story, but it was so good. It was such a good story. I don't know. I feel like I missed a plot point or something. Uh, I don't know. I, I don't know. I, oh, this is a weird one. Oh, that was so weird, but so good. Okay. I really like the idea of the um, the Fred Fredbear plush appearing everywhere. You know, in FNAF 4, when it's like the flower and then it's under the gutter. I really like that idea. Um, and I really don't know what this could mean in terms of the FNAF lore. I think I'm going to speak to some guys after this and, and figure it out. But I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't have any thoughts. Anyway, do you have any thoughts? Make sure you comment down below. Did you enjoy? This is a very long story. Apparently this book is really long as well, including Stitch Wraith. The Stitch Wraith is an abnormally long Stitch Wraith, so I can't wait for that. Anyway, thank you guys so much for watching, and I will see you in the next audiobook, which will be Sea Bonnies, which is exciting. <laughs> see you later. Goodbye.